might be thought that a fully libertarian culture would have no room for collective identities at all. But there is surely no reason to suppose this, for the sense in which libertarianism affirms individualism need not entail any deep-seated conflict with the affirmation of a densely textured cultural identity. It is quite possible to be an individualist who cherishes the sense of place, who treasures the contribution historical predecessors have made on his or her sense of self, who recognizes the importance, indeed, the inescapability of learning about the world and one's place in it from one's traditions. Cultural libertarianism need involve no commitment to a Promethean view of autonomy, an existentialist vision of self-creation, or a naively foundationalist rejection of tradition. One can be a cultural libertarian without aspiring to be the deracinated individual of philosophical fantasy. Cultural libertarianism is animated first and foremost by a desire, positively, to see the full range of human possibilities explored and put on display, and, negatively, to avoid the suppression of dignity, freedom, creativity, and uniqueness that occurs when people are subjected to the whims of hierarchs, experts, blue noses, busybodies, and paternalists. In short, cultural libertarians, quote, don't want to push other people around and don't want to be pushed around themselves, end quote. From Murray N. Rothbard, letter to David Berglund, June 5th, 1986, quoted Justin Raimondo, an enemy of the state, the life of Murray N. Rothbard. Seeking neither to push or to be pushed is quite compatible with seeing oneself as part of a wider whole, with making sense of one's own story in light of a more comprehensive narrative. Rejecting Illiberal Identities But if support for cultural libertarianism need not mean opposition to collective identity in principle, it is still certainly the case that it does mean rejection of particular sorts of collective identities. Cultural libertarianism will certainly prompt rejection, for instance, of racism and of multiple varieties of nationalism. It is quite possible to be a peaceful racist, to avoid racially motivated violence against person or property while nourishing prejudice and fostering and engaging in unwarranted discrimination. One may quite non-aggressively develop and cling to a sense of oneself defined by identification with one group of people on the basis of their race and dismissal of others on the basis of theirs. A narrowly political libertarianism may have nothing in particular to say about this sort of non-aggressive stance, but it seems likely to fall foul of a more broadly cultural libertarianism. Even if it is itself expressed nonviolently, this kind of racism can prompt violence. Racialized distributions of wealth and social power are often rooted in past acts of violence. Enslavement and disposition are particularly clear instances. Racism features an implicit unwillingness to see people as particular, as individual, and a penchant for reducing them to sets of stereotypes, and the underlying sense of the moral equality of persons that grounds libertarianism's rejection of statism is, at minimum, difficult to square with racial prejudice. None of this means that the cultural libertarian will judge it appropriate to use force to punish the racist for thinking bad thoughts or to prevent anyone from catering non-aggressively to racist tastes. But the cultural libertarian will be quite aware that, without status privilege to sustain it, racism in the context of economic life will prove to be prohibitively costly over time. In addition, the libertarian, here the purely political libertarian, will have no quarrel with the cultural libertarian, will favor remedies for past acts of injustice that may often serve to reduce the aggression-based power of the racist. The cultural libertarian will also strongly favor the use of nonviolent forms of social pressure, shunning, public shaming, peaceful boycotts, and peaceful protests and strikes, to challenge the racist behavior. Cultural libertarians will actively discourage racism, and more fundamentally, the widespread adoption of libertarian cultural values would make it difficult for anyone to sustain a sense of self rooted in racial superiority or exclusivity. There is no obvious incompatibility between embracing cultural libertarianism and identifying with a particular place, provided one simply values its treasures for their own sake or prizes its contribution to making one who one is, rather than judging other places to be objectively inferior. G. K. Chesterton and Bill Kaufman provide obvious and appealing models for an admirable localism. Conventional nationalism is another sort of creature altogether, however. Nationalism characteristically involves loyalty, not to a revered place as such, but rather to the nation-state. The libertarian can hardly welcome a willingness to cheer for, quote, my country, right or wrong, end quote, not only because to support wrongdoing is to risk moral corruption, but also because, quote, my country, end quote, really means not people and places dear to my heart, but rather the implacable apparatus of the state. Nationalism too often finds expression in violence, especially militaristic violence, 
whether of an irredentist variety or in support of state expansion. Of course it need not, but the cultural libertarian will be wary of its capacity to underwrite aggression. He or she will also look askance at nationalism's frequent valorization of state boundaries, which often fail to track culture or geography meaningfully. There may be little connection between the actual people and places on which one's loyalty focuses and the borders of one's state. Similarly, sensitive to individuality and diversity, the cultural libertarian will also recognize that the geographic territory claimed by nation-states is characteristically home to people with varied cultural identities. Loyalty to the nation often seems to mean loyalty to the majority in a particular region, or perhaps to a minority that holds the reins of state power. As a variety of collectivism, nationalism too frequently seems to involve the erasure of the particularity of those who don't identify with the majority's culture, including members of minority cultures, people who identify with multiple cultures, and people in some sense within the majority culture who seek in one way or another to transform it. The territory claimed by an enormous nation-state may arguably be not only too arbitrarily demarcated, but also too extensive to provide a manageable focus for personal loyalty. A genuinely local perspective may often prove more compatible with human-scale attachments. This does not mean, of course, that one can or should ignore the role of others who are not local in shaping one's identity and experience. The loiner may recognize London as a world quite different from his or her own, while still acknowledging that Trafalgar Square memorializes events without which life in Leeds might be very different indeed. But this need not provide an opportunity to smuggle nationalism in through the proverbial back door. For we can reasonably treasure our connections with geographically dispersed people and places, ones it would never occur to anyone to link with us under the same national umbrella, that have helped to make us who we are. Preserving Identity in a Libertarian Culture Whatever the fate of national and racial loyalties in a libertarian society, tensions surrounding families will doubtless be unavoidable. A society that tolerated aggression against children would hardly count as libertarian, but families unavoidably shape children in innumerable peaceful ways, and there will surely be those of a culturally libertarian bent who will seek to challenge what they see as illiberal indoctrination of children by parents. In a politically libertarian society, not only individuals but also families and other groups in search of mutually reinforcing support for their distinctive worldviews and life ways could obviously craft communities, territorial or virtual, in which their critical mass could allow them to counter the effects on each other of what they saw as objectionable elements of the wider culture. At the same time, it is easy to see that a society that created space for diversity would, indeed, render it difficult for any subcultural group to ensure wholesale identification with its traditions by all of its members. Cultural libertarianism will tend to militate against a range of habits and practices that might be seen by some people as integral to their collective identities. Identities of some sorts, I have already instanced racism and many sorts of nationalism, but there are obviously others, will not be likely to survive in a libertarian culture. Others will persist, and perhaps even thrive, while being transformed by libertarian attitudes that undermine subordination and exclusion. It would be unfair to deny that the loss of some cultural forms is a genuine loss, in the sense that it deprives people of patterns of existence and ways of understanding themselves and others that offer meaning and order to their lives. Those committed not only to political but also to cultural libertarianism will need to remind themselves and others that there are costs associated with the embrace of freedom. But this is hardly reason to treat cultural libertarianism as underwriting cultural decline. To repeat, no more than political libertarianism does cultural libertarianism require or promote the abandonment of all sources of collective identity. Those that respect freedom and individual particularity can thrive in a libertarian culture. To be sure, the very capacity of some life ways to fostering meaningfulness and order may be seen as depending on their immunity to criticism and their appearance of inevitability, and they will lack both in a culture of liberty. But an awareness of possibilities for improvement and a denial of critical regard to previously established cultural authorities can be quite compatible with continued esteem for and identification with traditions and communities and ways of life that offer people meaning and identity. Libertarianism and Identity a politically libertarian society will create space for many different kinds of identity-maintaining ways of being human, more, in general, than a society in which aggression is legitimized. Only those collective identities maintained through the use of force will be excluded from such a society, and will be, I believe, well rid of them. A society that is not only politically but also culturally libertarian will likely be free of such sources of identity as racism and nationalism. But this kind of society can still welcome local loyalty 
and any number of other identity-conferring relationships compatible with regard for individual dignity and freedom and the diverse forms of human flourishing. 